Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Thank you so much, Apostle Grace and um, the men and women of God who have joined us on this platform this morning as we teach on the fivefold ministry. Normally, this would be a topic we would do for several sessions, but I'll try to be, um, you know, to be as compact as possible and, and uh, share within the time we do have. Uh, Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you that you yourself, you will teach us. You are the great teacher. Let's make this word simple that everyone can understand it. And let grace be upon your word, on the speaker and the hearers today. Thank you, Lord, because you are the one that ascended and gave gifts unto men. Father, we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Someone has, someone has described the fivefold ministry by using your five fingers. And I want to start with that illustration generally. And then we'll start with the apostle. Now, the fivefold ministry, the Bible says, um, when Jesus ascended on high, he gave some to men, and um, he gave these fivefold ministries. The apostle has been described as the thumb, this thumb here. It's the strongest, and it can touch all the others, as we shall see. Uh, your index finger has been described more as the prophet, you know from that Old Testament concept that brings a warning and brings a word like that. The longest one, the middle finger, has been described as the evangelist, going into all the world. The ring finger, where you put your wedding band, has been described as a pastor. And the little finger, is the only one that can get it to your ear, has been described as the teacher. Amen. That is just like a simple definition. But I would like to give us, um, we'd like to start giving you some of the, um, the characteristics of this, of these gifts, the characteristics of these gifts. So I'll start with the apostle and uh, begin to teach along these lines today. It's very important that um, we know our calling and we know that we don't get there in one day. Amen. Amen. You know, we don't get there in one day. It's a process. Let me start by reading from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 um, to 13. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. Now, he that, he, now, now that he ascended, what is it but he also descended? First into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of a statue of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Let's just pause there. The Bible says it was Jesus that gave these gifts unto men. And he names the five ministry gifts. That tells you and I that we can't call ourselves. God has to call us. God has to put us there. And, um, um, and uh, you know, the apostle, that Greek word apostolos, starting with the apostle, the Greek word apostolos just means a sent one, like an ambassador. An apostle is a sent one, is a special envoy. It is, a, it is a ministry that you may be called into, but you don't start there. In Acts, Acts of Apostles, chapter number 13, 
from verse 1 to 3, the Bible says that uh, there were in the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manain, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. As the minister to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, now there were prophets and teachers here, but the Holy Ghost spoke concerning two of them, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they have fasted and prayed, hands were laid on them and they sent them away. No one starts directly like that in the office of the apostle. Barnabas and Saul were prophets and, and teachers before the call of being an apostle. Besides that, the Bible says, don't put a novice in office. So we grow. You may start even in the ministry, in another ministry, and God will grow you and bring you to that place. But you don't, it's a calling. When the time comes for that, you feel the call. Uh, and a need is not a call. It's not, oh, there's a need here. No. That you, there will be something God will drop on your inside. Now, another characteristic of an apostle is that apostles are foundation layers and pioneers. In 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 12, Paul says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builder thereon. But let every man take heed how he builded thereupon, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So he's telling us that he laid the foundation. He's a master builder. An apostle is like, the foundation layer, he, he sits there, he says, okay, we need to go into this region, or I need to build these churches, you know, and he begins to, he begins to lay foundation, he begins to say, we need to put this here, we need to put this here. He has an overview, he can look at what needs to be done, and God supernaturally gives him how to take a region, how to go into a place, how to build a movement, you know. So that is important, they are pioneers. A missionary who is truly called of God is an apostle because he goes into a region and he begins to invade that region. Uh, many ap apostles plant a lot of churches. I mean, apostles plant a lot of churches. And when God called me to this office, um, I didn't even know what it meant because I came out as a Baptist, God baptized my Holy Ghost. And he told me I've called you to be an apostle. I didn't know what apostle meant because my church background. We knew about pastors and evangelists. I, in my church background, we didn't really know about apostles. I never heard of it. But when God called me to it, well, I, I did many things before coming to where I am today. Mm -hmm. We planted a great number of them ourselves. You know, we go to many countries from where we are, and uh, we keep planting churches in impossible places. Uh, in, in, the, in the 1040 window, in the thick of the 1040 window. Even now, as I speak, we are building one right now in a very impossible place outside of our nation. But God, it's, it's grace. He just don't wake up and say, I want to do that. And I just start doing it overnight. But there's a progression. As you are faithful in one area, God can move you in another area. But it's not about titles. It's not about titles. It's about function. Is about really delivering function. Uh, apostles have a real encounter with the Lord. First Corinthians 9, 1 and 2. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are ye not my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle Lord to others, yet doubtless I am to you for the for the sin of my apostleship, are you in the Lord? And then you can see Galatians 1, 15 to 24 again. He's talking that, but when it pleased God, Galatians 1, 15 to 24, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal the Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I confirmed him with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and I returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and I bought within 15 days. Other apostles saw I know St. James, the lost brother. Now, the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards, I came into the region of Syria, and he's telling us that he was supernaturally taught of the Lord. He has seen the Lord Jesus Christ. He was given the assignment. Remember on the, on the road to Damascus, 
He was blinded by that light. He saw a vision, and Jesus said he was sending him. It's very important that um, now everybody who's going to be an apostle, you have a real encounter with the Lord. You will, you know, and, and things like that. But a genuine encounter because every ministry has got a position. And if we function out of our calling, we don't have the grace not to, to, to be there. It, it's, it's a gift from God that God drops into your life. And then the fruit of that calling, you start to see it. Um, apostles are fathering ministries. They, they father others. In 1 Corinthians 4.15, it says, For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I'll be gotten you through the gospel. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4.17 says, For this cause I sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved son. And then in 2 Timothy 2.1, Thou therefore my son. You can see Paul is, is relating to these guys that he had raised in the ministry. Apostles are fathering spirits. Of course, you can have people who are not apostles who are our fathers in the Lord. And, you know, maybe they led us to Christ or they helped us to grow. But, but, but generally, apostles, generally, they inspire other, other leaders. They, are, they, they have that grace to... Ministers seem to be attracted to them. Ministers seem to want to connect with them. They, they carry a grace that sets people moving. They carry a grace that, you know, one of the things that I find in my own life is I, I can look at somebody and be able to, by the Spirit of God, you know, I love to help them hold their hand and give them there. In 1989, the Lord took me to heaven and uh, in a very difficult time in my ministry, and I, I could see all these cloud of witnesses encouraging me and saying, don't give up. It was like a big stadium. They were all calling my name. I didn't know how to give my name. And when I was coming out of that, the Lord said, go and encourage other ministers. I believe that ministry to minister is part of the apostolic call. And that's why uh, when people have that kind of grace many times, people gravitate around them naturally, like magnets and metal. An apostle does not have has no business trying to force anybody to submit to them. The grace will pull them. And if it's not pulling them, you are not meant to. If it's not pulling them, you are not meant to. Uh, if it's not pulling them, you are not meant to, 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 to minister to them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Okay. So apostles are fathering spirits. They are fathering spirits. They, 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 they help to father other people. These people will come to you naturally. They are inspired naturally. And uh, one of the other things I say about apostolic gift is you, you, you know, at least for me, I don't know how it works, but I can look at people sometimes and just know where they're supposed to fit. I know, I just, I relate with them for a few minutes. I, I just know the gift, not because of what they've done. I guess that's supernatural itself, you know. Apostles bring balance in doctrine and order. First Timothy 4, 13 and 16. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, that let not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of, of the hands of the prebiscry, meditate upon those things, give thyself wholly to them, that by prop, thy prophecy may appear to all men. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Apostles bring balance in doctrine and order. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, I mean, he brought balance on communion, uh, on order, on gifts of the Spirit. And we're still reading them today. He's still giving us direction and order. The book of Galatians, he, he brought order on legalism. He brought instruction, balance in doctrine. Where some people say, well, doctrines don't really matter. Doctrines matter to an apostle. Uh, order matters to an apostle. Because that's just part of the makeup of the gift. And one of the problems, I'm not saying that apostles should go around, you know, trying to judge everybody, trying to bring everybody in order. But within the area of influence that God gives you, within the area of influence that God gives you, because um, apostles also have the area of influence that God gives them. One of the things that will be on an apostles had to be balance in doctrine and order. The book of the Thessalonians that he wrote, was on the coming of the Lord. And we're still reading it today. 
Now, some people say, well, it doesn't matter. Anybody can preach what they like. That's why the body of Christ is in so much confusion because the apostolic gifts that people have, some of these people have shied away in bringing order to their own community. Because an apostle Amen. has a community that God will give him. And if things are not right, it doesn't mean that they're trying to straighten everybody's life. It's by the teaching of the word. Paul did it by the teaching of the word, just showing them what the word of God says. For the Romans, Paul gave us fantastic teaching on grace. And we are still reading about it today. If you hadn't done it, only God knows what the world will look like. Just a few examples. In the book of Ephesians, Paul is teaching on the new creation. You can imagine what the world would be today if Paul had not put this order in place. So an apostle cannot shy away from order and doctrine. Amen. The other ministry gives me no bother about it. But an apostle is concerned. He carries that. And, and uh, you know, praise God. So it's very important that we understand that. But I also want to say that um, uh, I cannot go and enforce order and doctrine where it's not my community, where it's not my but that's what creates the confusion. But in the area of our influence, if we do the right thing, we'll be a blessing to the body of Christ. Apostles also enforce, enforce correction and discipline. Well, example is the Jerusalem Council. Uh, we'll give you so that you can see it in scripture yourself. Acts 15, verses 4 to 6. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders. And they declared all things that God had done with them. But there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying this, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and the elders came together for to consider this matter. If you skip to verse, 9, verse 19 of the same chapter, Wherefore my sentence is this, that we trouble not them, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them, that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time had in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then please it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send the uh, chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, son of Barnabas, and Silas, chief among the brethren, and they wrote the letters by them after this manner, the apostles and elders, and so on and so on. And then let me give you another example in 1 Corinthians 5, 3 to 5. Paul is writing in 1 Corinthians 5, 3 to 5. For I verily, as absent in my body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that I so done this day. And you know, he said, hand them over to the devil and all that. Well, some of those scriptures, we can never really read them because maybe they are not very clear, but I believe it's simple enough. You see, when there was a problem and the, the Gentiles got saved and people wanted to enforce legalism on them, uh, it was the church uh, in Antioch that came together. I mean, the, the, the church of God came together. Uh, they said, then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch. The church in Jerusalem came together. James was a was an apostle over the church in Jerusalem. They came together. The church in Jerusalem came together. And James was like the leader of that council. But they were able to enforce correction and say, this is not the way it's done. And discipline, like an apostolic council. And we need that, you know, in, in, in different companies, communities, and movements. People that can come together who have this kind of grace and try to bring order to the body of Christ. So the, the council in Jerusalem... You know, they, they sent uh, of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, and you know, they brought correction and discipline. It's all in the scripture. Paul said, A man who was cohabiting with his stepmother, Paul said, Hey, I judge in the spirit. Judgment is an apostolic place when you are led to judge. And you know, this judgment was to help the guy repent, but not to destroy the guy, it was to help the guy repent. But even judgment of nations is part of an apostolic function. When the grace is there to do it, God can make a cause of an apostle to pass judgment in different spheres of life where evil is rampant and heaven will back it up. If it is God, heaven will back it up and God will bring order to that kind of place. I can't give you examples, some of it, you know, uh, for the nature of those things. Apostles are pioneers, risk takers who take new territories. Apostles are pioneers, risk takers 
who take new territory. Romans 15, 20 and Romans 15, 25 and 26. You, yes, yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Uh, verse 25. It seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus. You know, an apostle <clears throat> is a pioneer. Like we walk on the front lines where we are here, not easy with all the terrorism and the uh, all things that are going on, but you, you, you are not trying to be, um, you are not trying to be some kind of hero. You are only there because God sent you there. And if God sends you there, then you get the job done. But uh, apostles go where they are sent. The Bible says, Barnabas and Paul have hazarded their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul said he was striving to preach where Christ was not preached. Apostles generally try to pioneer new areas, try to, you know, um, I remember the, the man of God, the prophet that God used to release me into ministry. Uh, when I went to him, and I was just, I was struggling very hard to get a note from this old English man, by uh, S.G. Elton, uh, that, was his, that was his name. And, and I, I was striving very hard to get a note from him to some big names. And I didn't realize it then when he told me, God wants you to put on your own. I mean, Nobody does that. It's a, it's a foundation. He wants you to lay a new foundation. And that is what we've done by the grace of God. Apostles strengthened the local church. They strengthened the church. You can find this in Acts 14, 21 to 28. Uh, I'll just read and skip here and there. And when they had preached the gospel, verse 21, to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith <clears throat> and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Let me pause there. There was a lot of persecution at this time. So they were going back, I said, through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. They were going back to just strengthen them. You know, and that's what the apostolic ministry is doing. When they come around, people feel that, ah, you know, there's some, some deposit, there's some some strength comes in. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and are praying with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. You see, again, Bible says they ordained them elders in every church. That means that that's part of the pioneering apostolic gifting to, to, to ordination of ministers is, is also an apostolic function. Ordination of ministers is also an apostolic function. That doesn't mean other ministry gifts cannot pray for people and put them in ministry, but this is a very capital part of the apostolic grace, uh, you know, uh, because with the apostolic gift, we're able to know certain things, you know, and who needs to be where. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word of God to Paga, they went down to, to Atalia, and then sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work they fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles and they abode long time with the disciples. 1536, Acts 1536. And some... We have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. That's a, it's like a... It's like a father, you know, checking on the kids. You know, there are different types of apostles, which I would like to also share with us. Uh, the, because we are covering a lot of ground today, I'll try to move a little bit faster. But there are different types of apostles. Paul was more of a roving apostle. <clears throat> he could stay any, any, anywhere between six months to maybe a year or two, three, maybe in a place, and then he moved again. Um, but it was coming back to strengthen the work, and making sure there was order, making sure, you know, uh, when I come to the pastoral gifting, I will explain some things, how we can balance that. But there are different apostolic types. For example, from Bible, James was an apostle, uh, but he was also a pastor. So he was like, the Jerusalem church was there, <clears throat> he was a pastor of that church, or the senior pastor of that church, or the overseer of that church, or the bishop, you know, and they had networks and people that were submitting to them. 
Paul was more of an apostle teacher because he also moved around. So apostles can lead the church like James, the brother of Jesus, did, you know. Uh, but he was more stationary. Uh, apostles can take new territories like, like Paul, Barnabas, Silas. Um, Paul is speaking in 2 Timothy 1, 11 and 12. <laughs> Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, <clears throat> an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. He calls himself a, uh, a preacher, an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles. Uh, which brings me to another point. Apostles can perform the role of other ministry games when the need arises. Now, Paul calls himself in that scripture a preacher. So apostle can do the work of an evangelist. He could, you know, if you look at the five fingers again, this one, the thumb, will be the apostle. And he can touch all these ones. So if an apostle goes into a new place, he can do the work of an evangelist. He preaches. He can do the work of a teacher. He teaches. Um, he can do the work of a prophet. He can even do the work of a pastor for the season when he's needed. You know? So an apostle can perform the role of other ministry gifts when needed. Apostles and prophets are used in the ministry of impartation. Apostles and prophets are used in the ministry of impartation. Romans 1.11 For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that ye may be established. Romans 1.11 I, I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift. Um, I, I, I do believe that you know, someone like Pa S. G. Elton, my contact with him, God dropped something in my life. I don't know how to explain that. But you know, impartation happens. And I have I've laid hands on people personally and um, you know, and I, they start operating prophetically. They start seeing, they start knowing, the gift of seeing and knowing drops on them. So again, that is part of the apostolic prophetic function. Ordination of ministers is an apostolic grace. Titus 1.5 For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I have appointed thee. For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city. So this is also an apostolic grace. We saw it earlier. Paul ordained elders in the city when they traveled. He also had other people working under him that did that. Apostles and your persecution. In fact, one of, the, one of the things where people should not covet this office is that persecution goes with it big time. Galatians 5.1 And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I mean, one place, Paul said, the whole of Asia turned against it. The whole of Asia turned against it. Everybody left him. This is one of the unpleasant parts of an apostolic grace because an apostle is in the face of the devil and usually you face heavy persecution and anybody who has, uh, God has led to pioneer anything at all can tell you that <laughs> it's heavy. They face a lot of persecution. I already mentioned this point that all the gifts will operate in an apostle as the spirit wills. We, we mentioned that already. Uh, so basically, I've taken a lot of time on this one, uh, but I'll move on to the next gift, the office of a prophet or the prophetic ministry. Um, in the Old Testament, guidance came through the prophets in the Old Testament because the anointing only rested on the prophet, the priest, and the king. Guidance came through the prophet's ministry in the Old Testament. Now that's the, and that's 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 there's a good reason why, why that is, um, because the Holy Ghost was not on other people, but in the New Testament the prophetic ministry is different, because um, some of these scriptures we we'll write them down so we can move. First uh, Corinthians three sixteen, First Corinthians six nineteen, First Corinthians three sixteen, First Corinthians six nineteen, Second Corinthians six sixteen. Romans 8.14. In the New Testament, however, 
we are the body of Christ. The whole of us are the body of Christ. And because the Holy Ghost lives in us, confirmation comes through the prophetic gift in the New Testament. Confirmation comes through the prophetic gift in the New Testament, which means that what the prophet is saying, according to Romans 8, 14, the Bible says, as many as are led by this, uh, uh, it said the Spirit of God, rather, bear at witness with our spirits. You have a witness in your heart. How do you know you are saved? How do you know you are saved? You just know. Every believer has a knower on the inside. Every one of us, we have a knower on the inside. We know something. Sometimes you just know something. Um, like you're saved, you just know it. So when somebody gives you a prophetic, prophetic word, it will bear witness. If it doesn't bear witness, leave it on the shelf for a while and just see. Uh, because you are not supposed to be led by the prophets. You're supposed to be led by the Holy Spirit. That's a big difference. Unfortunately, some people don't understand that. And they go and they tell people, you need to marry this, and you need to leave town, and you need to do that, and you need to do the other one, without allowing the people to have confirmation. If you don't have confirmation, and you are being made to do something, that is manipulation. You are being manipulated, and that is a manifestation of a spirit of witchcraft. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, there are two types of prophecy. The simple gift of prophecy, according to 1 Corinthians 14, 1 to 5, um, there's a simple gift of prophecy and there's predictive prophecy. But let me read verse 2, 1 Corinthians 14, 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. For he that prophesied speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. Now, for the purpose of what we are teaching, that's 1 Corinthians 14, 1 to 5. But for the purpose of our teaching, because I'm not teaching on gifts of the Spirit today, I'm teaching on ministry gifts, we need to understand that it's a simple gift of prophecy to edification, to exhortation, and to comfort. All right? There's a good example of uh, predictive prophecy. Let me make this point. Predictive prophecy operates more in the ministry of a prophet. Predictive prophecy operates more in the ministry of a prophet. Let's go to Acts 21, verses 8 to 12. I would like to read that because it's very important. Predictive prophecy operates more in the office of a prophet. Acts 21, 8. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came into Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. I know Philip was a deacon, and uh, Philip... Uh, Philip became an evangelist. Apparently, um, you know, he got to Samaria and settled down and um, and so on. Anyway, his daughters prophesied. And verse 10, as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet. Now the daughters prophesied, the daughters prophesied, but there was a prophet. They prophesied to edification, exhortation, and comfort. But there was a prophet named Agabus in verse 9. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's garden and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus said the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owned this garden and shall deliver him to the hands of the Gentiles. And when we had these things, both we and they that of the place besought him not to go to Jerusalem. But of course, you know, Paul went. Now, the difference between the prophecy these guys, the girls gave, the Philip's daughters gave, was that they encouraged the people. But the prophecy that Agabus gave, he bound his own, you know, he, he took Paul's garden and bound his own hands and feet and said, listen, you're going to be jailed. So that was more specific. That was more, and without grace, you just don't jump into that. You just don't jump into predictive prophecy because there are gifts of the spirit. And I want to make the point that being prophetic and operating the office of the prophet are not the same. We can all be prophetic. The whole church can even prophesy the believers to one another. We can all give encouraging words, but don't without grace, because there are gifts that operate with it. And I will, I will explain that to you. Prophets operate in at least two of the revelational gifts. Uh, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, and the discerning of spirit, plus prophecy consistently. The revelational gifts are the gifts that... Um, uh, they know something. They know something. The word of knowledge, 
because of time, just to give you a little background, has to do with the past and the present. It has to do with the past and the present, where God, you know, will show you, like the woman at the well, Jesus said, you know, told her history, it was a word of knowledge. And then the word of wisdom has to do with the future. It's not the wisdom of James 1.5. James 1 5 says, if we lack wisdom, we should ask God. You know, that's just any believer who wants to know how to do something can ask God. Otherwise, 1 Corinthians 12 8 will not be accurate then. Because if for to one is given the word of wisdom, for to one is given the word of knowledge, for to one is given the gift of healing. So the, the word of knowledge, present and uh, 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 past and present, the word of wisdom, future. The discerning of spirits is very important in the prophet's ministry. That is to see into the realm of the spirit. There are about four ways you can see. You can see with your eyes closed, like, like when uh, Paul was blinded by the light on the road to Damascus, he was blinded. But he, he, he saw Jesus. So he didn't see with his eyes, he saw him with his eyes because we have eyes of, of the heart. And then, of course, um, there are trances when it's like he fell into a short sleep. Peter fell into a trance when he was on that. Uh, when uh, uh, Cornelius came, you know, sent people to see him, you know, he fell into a trance like a short sleep. And of course, there are open vision when your eyes are wide open and you see something, you know, and, you know, that's, a, a, you know, but it's very important that goes with, that goes with prophecy. So if you are not seeing, you know, you, you can, I mean, you can have an impression and prophesy, but to consistently work in that office, these revelation gifts should be commonplace with you. Uh, by God's grace, this is part of my gifts mix as well. Uh, sometimes I'm just minding my own business, shaving in the morning, and boom, I see a vision. Sometimes I'm even watching TV. Can you believe that? And I see a vision, and I see the scroll. And, I mean, I just see something right on the screen, but it's not really there. Nobody else can see it. So, you know, this is a, is a very important gift. So, we need to that's why Paul said we should prophesy according to faith. We need to prophesy to the degree of what we have. Uh, but I tell you, uh, the office is what we are dealing with today. And um, for a prophet, these gifts need to be in operation commonly. Now, um, prophecies should be judged by the prophetic prebistry uh, uh, when prophets prophesy. Prophecies should be judged by the prophetic prebistry Prophets prophesied. We read a scripture the other time, First uh, Corinthians fourteen twenty nine and thirty, and even uh, and thirty. Yeah, First um, Corinthians fourteen twenty nine. Let the prophets speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another and stood by, let the first hold his place. It's telling us that, you know. Now let me read verse thirty one so that we will understand it properly. For you may all prophesy one by one that all may. Learn. <laughs> I've never seen that before. I've never seen that before. Learn and all may be comforted. I've never seen that before. Anyway. Now, hmm. and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophet. Now, in a believer's meeting, first Corinthians 14, 31, in a believer's meeting where it's just us, we can encourage people in the church to use their gifts of encouragement, you know. You, you suddenly feel a word, and you hear a word, and you say something. You know, but that's edification, encouraging people, exhortation, you know, and comfort. You're just encouraging. It's just there. So that we may all learn. That means, I mean, because earlier on, Paul said, I wish that you all prophesied. This is, I wish that you were all prophets. They say, I wish that you all prophesied. So edification is edification and comfort. There must be, we must create opportunities like that. Where we can encourage it. in such a situation, the pastor, whoever is leading it, will say to people, please, all the words we're expecting from you are words of encouragement. A lot of people shy away from these things and then they complain about the dryness in their churches. So people don't want any wildfire, but I would rather have a little wildfire than no fire at all. That's why you're there as the coach. All mm. these things are coaches. You're supposed to coach the church to go out and be effective. So when we're all together, if somebody misses, it, there's a way you can tell them with love and say, hey, I think that's a bit too far, you know? But the prophets, when the prophet stands up and says there will be no rain, you better have some people judge that because you can bring problem and disgrace to the body of Christ. 
Um, I have a team. I don't call them prophets per se, but previously of ministers, we come together. And will you believe that every time we meet, we meet once a week, we pray for like one to two hours, and the visions just confirm themselves. They just confirm themselves. They confirm themselves. We God shows us, you know, things like who will win an election, who will not win an election. He shows us things about our people. But we are all there and we judge it. When we finish praying, people come up with what God told them. But these are not lay people in church. These are ministers. And that's a good way for a prophetic prophecy to operate. So that before you go and give a national prophecy and embarrass, and I think, I don't want to go into too many details, some of the things that have happened, you know, that became sensational in recent times, if the prophetic prophecy had been operating properly, we can balance some of these things. Amen? Because if God shows something, according to what Paul says, uh, he said, if God reveals something, the other person should hold their place and we should judge prophecy. Now, when we judge prophecies, it doesn't mean we judge people. And the fact that somebody, some, a prophet gives a word and it didn't happen or was delayed, it doesn't mean that person is a false prophet. Because a lot of people, oh, the prophecy failed. The man must be fake. He needs to, he needs to resign. No, no, no. A false prophet is the fruit of their lives. Now, let me show you an example. Now, let me, let me finish reading. Uh, let's go to First Thessalonians 5, 19 to 21. Quench not the spirit. First Thessalonians 5, 19 to 21. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. I mean, God has given me prophecies to people and told them they will win election as governor or they will go to parliament. I'm not usually excited to give such prophecies. <laughs> if I went somewhere and God gave me a prophecy for a man, um, I was in South Africa many years ago, and God told me that he should hand over his ministry to his son. And I thought, I was just the first time in that church. I thought, I, am, I must be losing my mind. This is crazy. So I gave the word and I felt so bad. I felt so bad. Anyway, I got on the plane, came back home. A few months later, they were calling me. The man did it. And he died and went to heaven. God was preparing him. So you just don't go prophesy that. When God shows you nothing. You don't get up and tell the man, it's very, it's heavy. You don't, I mean, I was sitting with one politician one time and God said to me, tell him he's going to be the governor. The guy looked at me and said, there's so much violence, nothing can happen. But I've had many experiences like that, just to name a few. Even in Europe, you know, you're going to go to the parliament, it looks crazy, and they go. The truth is that the prophetic grace is wonderful, but if the, if, if the other gifts are not operating, don't force yourself into it because you can destroy people's lives. Mm. Okay? And let me also say that for me personally, if a word is correction, I, 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 I will switch off that mic and I'll talk in your ears, but I will never embarrass anybody in public. I just don't do that. I mean, I just don't do that. God can show you even a sin in someone's life, then switch up that mic. It doesn't make you any super anything. It's just ignorance. If you, if you embarrass people and make them look dirty because you destroy their faith, you know. So I think people need to be careful. Uh, even if this gift is operating in our lives, it's to build up the church. It's not to destroy the church. It's to build people up. People should not come to your meeting and feel like dirt because you're a prophet or whatever, you know. Okay? Go to the um, 20, 18, verse 21 and 22. Deuteronomy 18, 21 and 22. If thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. Now, and the point I'm making is that prophets who speak presumptuously are not necessarily false prophets. If they speak, they just presume. You know, it doesn't mean they're false prophets. It just means they misspeak. Okay? Now, and I'm not saying that they should not be held accountable. 
But for us to be quick to just say you're a false prophet, you're a false prophet. Some of it is just that they're human after all. And if you know the how heavy that grace is, you don't even want it. <laughs> you don't even want it. It's like, oh God, give somebody else that. Yeah. In fact, for me personally, I'd rather go to a meeting and pray for the sick, preach the word, and get out. <laughs> but most times the thing drops on me and I start to see and I start to say, and I, I most times I struggle with it. I say, well, not today, not today. But when you see people crying and weeping, and it's like, who told you about me? Who, you know, then you, it's a blessing. So let's not get taken with titles. Let me show you another. Let's look at another scripture. In Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 1 to 5, you can see how Prophet Nathan missed it. But well, it wasn't a false prophet, but he made a mistake. Let me, let's read it. And it came to pass... When the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in the house of Cedar, for the ark of God dwelleth with curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thy heart, for the Lord is with thee. Nathan, when, when, when King David said, Listen, I'm going to build a house for God. He said, Go and do it. This is a, it's a great idea. But it was not a God idea. And it came to pass that night, verse 4, that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus said the Lord, Shall thou build me a house for me to dwell in? He said it yesterday. In the night, God came to him and said, Hey, go and tell him. He will not build it. Does it mean he's a false prophet? It just means he's human. So what I'm saying, I'm not saying there are no false prophets. And I'll probably touch that a bit, but what I'm saying is that the fact that something is not 100%, I mean, if you have a tap and you open the tap, the, the water coming out can pick a little taste from the tap, but it doesn't mean it's not water. So we should be very careful because something is not 100%. God is taking a risk on all of us to even agree to use us. Mm -hmm. I always say to people, hey, if this prophecy doesn't resonate with you, doesn't make sense to you, doesn't give you peace, throw it away, trash it, or put it on the shelf. Mm. I say that before I start ministering in prophecy. I usually try to remind myself to say that. Because mm. some people, because they are not in the place to even receive that word, or their life is not just there yet, they don't receive a word that is true for them. You know? Um, so, <laughs> so that's another, another uh, prophets do not know everything. Prophets do not know everything. You have to be careful with a prophet that tells you, I want to tell you all about your life. That's a lie. That's a lie. Because the Bible in 1 Corinthians 12 says, to one is given the word of knowledge. It's a word out of the vast knowledge of God. The word of wisdom is a word out of the vast knowledge of God. You don't tell me, but I can tell you all about you. Now, I'll talk about familiar spirits later, but look at this example in the Bible. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 27, uh, you remember the story of the Shunammite woman when she, her baby died, a child died, and she went to the prophet? The prophet said, and when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came there to trust her away. And the man of God said, let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her. And the Lord had hid it from me and has not told me. You all agree that Elisha was a top, 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 top prophet. But he didn't know that. So you don't need to be afraid of prophets that, like, oh, this prophet knows all about my life, this prophet. Knows. God doesn't give you a gift to, to make people uncomfortable, to make people worship you and, you know, uh, you know. And um, another, another example again is that um, in Second Kings chapter 5, uh, verse 10 and verse 25 and 26. I'm not going to read that. Um, Gehazi, 2 Kings 5, 10, and then verses 25 and 26. Gehazi took the gift from Naaman. If Elisha always knew everything he did, he wouldn't have tried it. But Elisha said, but my spirit went with you when you did it. You know? Um, so it's very, very important that we don't get into bondage to prophets and feel that the prophet must. And let me say another thing. A lot of people, when they, at least in this part of the world, 
they, you know, they want to get married, they go to a prophet, they want to do this, they go to a prophet, they want to. There's nothing wrong in seeking counsel, but you have to know that these gifts operate as the spirit wills. You just don't operate it, you know. Sometimes I want it to operate, it doesn't operate, I just leave it. But I'm always happy when it operates, when the God moves on me like that. I, I, I'm always happy when it operates. So, but you need, every child of God needs to develop that inward witness. When you have a check, a stop sign, a green light, you need to develop that in your life. When you develop that in your life, hey, the prophet will confirm what you already have. Now, familiar spirits know things about people, but it's not the spirit of prophecy. Now, so familiar spirit knows, they know things about people, but it's not the Holy Ghost. Go to Acts chapter 16, verse 16 and 17. Let me read this one. Acts 16, uh, 16 to 18. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by such saying. And the same followed Paul and us and Christ, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us unto us the way of salvation. And this uh, did she many days, but Paul being grieved, turned again and said to the spirit, I command in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her, and it came out of her same hour. You know, there was trouble there. This girl was possessed with the spirit of divination. In some churches today, she will be a prophetess or a, or a deaconess or something. But because people cannot tell the difference. Now, she, she, what she said was true. She said, these are the servants of God telling us the ways of God. But it was not inspired by the spirit of God. It was inspired by a spirit of divination. And sadly, in our part of the world, we have, I know, people they call prophets who are actually operating by the spirit of divination. They know things because even traditionally, there are people that can, uh, that, that can divine and tell you about your life, where you kept your jewelry, where you kept your this, where you kept your dad, things that are sacred, they, they are, they are, it's a spirit of divination. God, the ministry of a prophet is not soothsaying. It's not soothsaying. It's not, we're, in, we're not into fortune telling. That's not the ministry of a prophet. We're not into fortune telling in the New Testament. That's not what it is. So, um, the, we, need to, we need to understand this. Um, even, even um, what's his name? Uh, Saul, in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 28, verse 7 to 25. I'm not going to read it, but you can write it down. 1 Samuel 28, verse 7 to 25. You find um, Saul looking for a woman with a familiar spirit in verse 7. When God rejected him, he said, Then said Saul unto his servant, Seek me a woman that has a familiar spirit, that may go to her and inquire of her. I, I was in a meeting. Somebody invited me. And I was sitting there. I was late. I didn't, couldn't find the place. And when, we got in, when I got in there, I sat at the very back. And there was a prophet, so-called, and all the word of knowledge and word of wisdom he had was about people's bank accounts, and people's ATM numbers, and people's, um, you know, and, and people were spinning around and coming to drop that. And, and I, I just said, this is not the Holy Ghost. This is not When all the words that God gives you is about money, we need to question the authenticity of that gift. Mm. But I sat at the back quietly and he kept walking up and down. And once our eyes met the meeting, the guy began to say, well, some people think I'm using, I'm using an evil spirit here. And, and he shut down and went and sat down. That was the end of it. The thing is that there are familiar spirits. And the fact that somebody tells you something that is true, you know, like you're some, some prophets give phone numbers and all this kind of thing. And I'm not saying the Holy Ghost cannot do that. But you have to check to be sure you have peace about it. You know all these prophecies about go and bring, go and bring your, your go and bring your uh, bank accounts, go and withdraw all the money and bring and this kind of thing. Go and bring your car, go and bring it. You know, it, 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 it that's not the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church must be careful with those who prophesy for the wages of divination, like Balaam. The church must be careful with those who prophesy for the wages of divination like Balaam. You know, Balaam started well, but didn't finish well. Judges one, uh, Jude, uh, 
Let's see. Jude 1 11. Jude 1 11. It says, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Bela for reward and perished in the gain saying of Corinth. You know, Balaam, if you read the story, uh, Numbers 22, 13 to 17, if you read the story, they brought gifts to him and it tainted him at the end. Eventually, although what he did eventually was that he, he put, he advised how to make the children of Israel sin by making them worship a false gods and they were committing fornication and all that and judgment came on them all because of gain. Uh, 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 you don't prophesy for money. You don't, you, don't, you don't heal, or you pray for the sick on the healing line, and people put money in your hand, you have to say no. I mean, they can give into the offering, but you know, it's like you're just a diviner. You put money down, then you begin to speak. That's how it's done in traditional religion here in Africa. You, you go in, you drop some money, and then the guy start, then the money will prompt the gifts, you know? Mm. <laughs> But that's crazy. That's, that's, that's not the Holy Ghost. That's not our spirit. What people need to understand, you see, from the, the Western standpoint, from people in the West, and let me help you clarify something. The fact that you got into a place and you felt something doesn't necessarily mean it's the Holy Ghost. A lot of people go to many places and say, oh, I just felt something. Well, you need to check it. The word of God, there are so many signals in this room now. The word of God is the decoder. If it's not lining up with scripture, if it's not giving you peace on the inside, then it's not God. I know one guy, uh, I was ministering, we were ministering somewhere in the U.S. and the pastor told us that somebody, they, they had gone to a particular place in Africa, I will not mention where, and a prophet had ministered to them. When they left, one of the young men that went with them became widely insane, mad. They had to literally chain him down to get him back home. And the Holy Ghost doesn't do that. I don't have a lot of time. Maybe God give us a lot of opportunity, but I want to get through what I what I promised. Um, that we're not we're in a new covenant where this, this new covenant, the Holy Ghost lives in us. And when we spend so much time. You know, in Africa, when you go to uh, a Juju man or a Habanis or a Voodoo man, you are given so many elements water, salt, honey, uh, padlock, uh, leaves, uh, new money, and uh, sand. God might leave a prophet to do a prophetic act. Okay, a prophetic act. He might, like Jesus, and put it in somebody's eyes, okay? And the person was healed. But how many times did he do that in scripture? You cannot make a prophetic act into a doctrine. Sadly, sometimes you see on social media, prophets telling people to eat grass. People are eating grass, grass like sheep. And prophets tell people to drink petrol, benzene. Are you drinking petrol? Because the prophet said, come on, what's wrong? You have the Holy Ghost. So genuine prophets stay with the word of God first. And what they give you will confirm in your heart. But if you are restless on the inside, you need to be careful. Because people say, oh, I just felt a presence. Of course, anywhere there's a spiritual activity, you're going to feel a presence. Mm. But you need to be sure that you have peace in your heart. The word of God is first place. Now, we also need to know that there are conditional prophecies. Second Kings chapter 20, verses 1 to 5. Second Kings 20, 1 to 5. You can read it on your own, and I will just tell you what it's all about. Second Kings 20, 1 to 5. You remember the story there of um, um, Hezekiah? Okay. I have so much notes here sometimes. All right, here it is now. Second Kings 21 to 5. Remember the story of Hezekiah? Um, the prophet said, you know, set your house in order, you will die. Verse 1. And then he prayed and he cried. And uh, verse 3, 4 says, And it came to pass 
afore or before Isaiah was gone out into the middle of that the word of the Lord came to him saying, Turn again and say to him, I'm going to extend his life. So I paraphrase. Now that was conditional. The moment Hezekiah repented, God said, It's not going to happen. So Abraham, go and kill your son. Abraham, don't kill your son. There are conditional words. And you know, it's not every word that God gives you. God, if God gives you a prophecy that you're going to be a giant in the kingdom, and you don't you spend your time doing carnal things, how is it going to be fulfilled? So sometimes there are conditional prophecies. Uh, now, prophecy is meant to glorify Jesus and draw attention to the Savior alone. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a cause, and that no man say that Jesus is Lord by the, but by the Holy Ghost. It, it, the attention, that's 1 Corinthians 12, 3, has to be on Jesus. Revelation 19, 10. Revelation 19, 10. Revelation 19, 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See, thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What does that mean? Every prophet, prophecy should testify of Jesus, should draw us to Jesus. We, we should want to get closer to Jesus and not worship the prophet. And that brings me to one more thought before we take the evangelist. I want to say to us that prophecies are never superior to the word of God and must never contradict the word of God. Prophecies are never. If somebody prophesies to you and say, oh, you say, oh but the Bible says, no, 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 no. My prophecy is bigger than the Bible. That's a false prophet. Because it's negating the word of God. The word is also Jesus. According to John 1. Now look at um, um, Isaiah 8.20. Isaiah 8.20. It says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. If somebody is prophesying and negates the word of God, just forget about it. Somebody says, thus said the Lord, you should marry somebody's wife. You don't need to think about that. that that's just crazy. We just, you don't need to pray about something like that, you know. Or someone says, thus said the Lord, give me the deed, or, you know, the deed for your house. Give it to me. You know, you don't need to pray about that. Did God tell you that? And women have to be very careful. Sometimes they get so emotional. I just want part of the ball. Oh, the prophet said that you bring the car. You take the car. You didn't even tell your husband. And he said, the family car. Come on. Second Peter 1.19. <laughs> we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto the light that shines in the dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. We have a more sure word of prophecy. If God is clear about something, don't become unclear about it because of the prophet. If God says, don't do this, and the prophet says, do it, just forget the word of the prophet. There's no prophet's word. That can, there's no prophet anybody can give that can stand at the same level with scripture. All scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16, is given by the inspiration of God, profitable for reproof, for instruction, and so on. Now let's go to the evangelist. Uh, of course, from our foundation scripture, you saw that in Ephesians 4 11. We're not going to read that again. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists. Um, but I think a very good example of the evangelist we, we, we find in scripture would be Philip. He's the one that the Bible really calls an evangelist. Hallelujah. He was a deacon again, and you know, he grew. I'm not saying you grow into a gift, he was found faithful, and God dropped the gift of. An, an, an evangelist. Some people have this notion that, oh, I've been a teacher for so long. Now I need to move to the next gate. So now I'm a pastor. Now I've been a pastor for so long. Now I need to move to the next gate. And, uh, you know, I must be an evangelist. Now I've been an evangelist for so long. Now I need to move to the next gate. 
I have become a prophet. I have been a prophet for so long. No, come on. It's not like elementary school. It's like we go from grade to grade. It's a calling. And if your calling is there, it's your heart, just like an evangelist. An evangelist's passion is soul winning. Now, if you look at um, um, uh, Acts 21 8, it says, And the next day we were, of course, company departed and came to Caesarea. We entered the house of Philip, the evangelist. So that's a very good New Testament example. Um, and uh, Paul also told Timothy in um, 2 Timothy 4 5 to do the work of an evangelist. Okay? The evangelist's passion is to win souls. Now, an evangelist preaches Christ. When the Bible says you preach Christ, it means a salvation message. The heartbeat of an evangelist is so winning. Maybe a great example would be Ram Bonke, our brother that has gone to heaven. Give me Africa. He's, he's, he, when he looks at the stars, he sees stones. You know, an evangelist, you know, with Philip, you could see that Philip was just. I mean, he was a deacon, but you know, I have a problem with many evangelists because they, I don't understand them sometimes. I've operated in that office at some point, you know. Uh, but you, a real evangelist, you don't need a pulpit. You just look for people. On, in the mall, you want to talk to them. In the, you know, is that, the whole thing about many students is the heart. You know, the Bible says that, um, uh, was it Saul now? After it was given, his heart was changed. God, God will give you a shepherd's heart. The, the, the thing is a heart. Ministry comes from inside. God will give you a shepherd's heart. A heart that, wow, you just, you just know, you just are having a different passion. You look at people, a pastor can see an unsafe person. and will be thinking, oh, it'd be nice for this guy to be in church. If he's well-trained and disciple, he will witness. But an evangelist, when he sees somebody, the first thing, are they saved? Are they going to heaven? An evangelist thinks sold. If you are eating in a dining table, he's looking at who's not who's going to heaven. You know, if, if you are on a holiday, evangelist is witnessing it. If, you know, so it's the heart that God gives. This all comes to the pastoral gift. This is the same thing. He gives you a heart. Evangelist is looking at it, and you know, and you know, the, the, the ministry gifts are mixed sometimes. Somebody may be a pastor evangelist. Somebody may be a prophet. You know, evangelist, somebody, and we have many examples, you know. So in Acts chapter 8, from verse 5, you can write it down on to verse 8. You can see that he preached Christ. Preaching Christ means he preached salvation. Another thing about the evangelist is that the evangelistic ministry goes with the gifts of healing. The evangelist ministry goes with the gift of healing. And um, it's very important. Let me read it so you can see it yourself. Uh, the Bible says, verse 7, For a spirit with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies that were lame were healed. You can see gift of healing is one of the things with an evangelist. Like in the office of an apostle, you also see signs and wonders. You know, signs and wonders also go with the apostle. But gifts of healings, also go with the evangelists. It's um, it's very very uh, important. Uh, apart from the passion for souls, signs, wonder, miracles, uh, healings, and miracles, they go with the office of the evangelists. The miracles in Acts eight chapter six, Acts eight six, the miracles get the attention of the people, but the preaching of the word brings salvation. The miracles get the people's attention. That means wow. I've been in some crusades where the Lord would just give me a word, like, you know, call out deaf people. When the Holy Ghost moves on me like that, we can see a dozen or more heels, just, just like that. And then, but the goal is not to, is not to make you look, oh, is to make people, okay. I was in a meeting in one country in Eastern Europe, in Romania specifically, and um, you know, uh, our permit was cancelled by the police, and it was raining. It was you know, but a twelve-year-old deaf and dumb girl. By the time she got healed and could speak and hear, 
people started pouring and even the police came for prayer. So the gifts of healing and miracles, the mission of an evangelist is to get people's attention. But it is the preaching of the word of God that wins people to Christ. Now, if you look at that story, uh, let me also say that the ministry of exhortation is not the same as that of an evangelist because healings and miracles do not follow an exhorter. There's a ministry of exhortation in Romans chapter 12, verse 8. Romans 12, 8. Or he that exhorted on exhortation, he that giveth, let it be to the people. An exhorter is somebody that stirs up the people. An exhorter can come in and just, you know, he kind of stirs the people. But an evangelist will have healings and miracles. And you know, it's not, it's about God's grace. If it's not there, just stay where God has placed you. So, so an evangelist's passion is for souls. And you, you realize in that story that um, Peter and John had a ministry to minister the Holy Ghost baptism in Acts chapter 8, Acts 8, 14 to 17. Apparently, Philip did not have that kind of gifting. You know, pray for people to receive the Holy Ghost. All of us can do that if we learn how to do it. But there are people that are gifted to do it. Okay? Peter and John had a ministry to minister Holy Ghost baptism because they were sent for. And what was when they came, that the masses received that. I've seen this in my life uh, over the years that I, I can hardly remember anybody I prayed for to receive the Holy Ghost baptism when they came to receive. I mean, it could be thousands of people. So evangelists have to work with other gifts. That's what I'm trying to say here. An evangelist has to work with other gifts. And I also want to say that an evangelist ought to have a home church. You know, a lot of evangelists say, well, I'm an evangelist. I just want, you know, an evangelist should not be a lone ranger, just running around because you need other gifts around you. So that, for example, if you're in a church, you can be part of the ministry gifts in that church. You can be part of the eldership when you're around. You can be part of the team when you're around. So, you need a home church, your family needs a home church, you need a pastor as an evangelist, uh, because if you don't have one, it can be quite a challenge. All right, I know I've been going for some time, but I will have to just finish. I have just two more to go, a pastor and a teacher. Um, so let's take the pastor. The Greek word for pastor simply means shepherd. Jesus is a shepherd and all pastors are under shepherds. Jesus is the chief shepherd and all pastors are under shepherds. The word pastor, the Greek word means shepherd. Um, pastors, overseer, bishop, they all have the same basic meaning. Although bishop and overseers are often referred to people with a wider oversight, with a wider oversight, maybe over churches and so on, but it's a big basic, basic uh, meaning. Uh, a genuine pastor knows that the church does not belong to him. It's not a personal property. Jesus is the chief shepherd. John 10, 11. John 10, 11. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Hebrews 13, 20. Hebrews 13, 20. Now the God of all grace that has brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. Again, he's the great shepherd of the sheep. 1 Peter 2, 25. For you are going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. Jesus is the shepherd and bishop of our souls. 1 Peter 2.25. 1 Peter 5.4. 1 Peter 5.4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. The pastoral office is often referred to as the one, this finger where we put the wedding ring. This one here, where we put the wedding ring, is a family person. Uh, 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 the pastor has a heart of a shepherd. The, the pastor is always... Now, people that are pastor, pastor, that, that's their primary gift. If they are not careful, they can kill themselves. When I say kill themselves, I mean, your heart is so good that uh, if somebody is sick in the hospital, you just want to be there for them. You just... Somebody has a baby, you want to babysit if you can. Somebody needs to mourn their lawn, you can find them. I mean, people that just have, it's, it's a wonderful gift. 
but it's also a very limiting gift because if you if you if you want to really grow a church you are going to have to delegate for that church to grow if you do everything you will not have any grace to preach remember the early church they said listen let's find some deacons who will help us with the business of the church so we can give ourselves to prayer and fasting a pastor should have the ability to teach and to nurture the people, to preach, teach, preach, to nurture the people. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, 2, a bishop then must be um, blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, sober of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to cheat, to teach, apt to teach. 2 Timothy 2, 24 also says um, you should be apt to teach. So that, that teaching gift is important. Um, Pastors can pastor supernaturally if they have revelation gifts operating in them. You know, I spoke about that in the office of a prophet, the word of knowledge, sign of spirits. Instead of running around the whole time, God can show you things about your members when you pray. And even without being there physically, you can know their condition. So pastors should also desire these kind of gifts if they don't have them. It's, in the, it's a, a, a bit of a prophetic gift, but if you, can, if, you are, if you are knowing things about past and present, if you are seen in the spirit, you can know things about your people without even being there, and you can pray for them. Um, God will hold the pastor responsible for the souls under them. And, uh, and that's why the pastor needs the authority to function, because one person is going to answer for the souls under them. Hebrews 13, 17. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey them that have rule over you, and submit yourselves for the watch over your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Uh, so pastor is, is the chief, is, a, is, a, is the primary gift in the, the local church. Pastors must learn to delegate to be effective. And we can find us in Acts chapter six, from verse two to four, that the early church had to get deacons involved, you know? And I want to say to you that if you're a deacon or you're an elder in the local church, your ministry is to hold the hands of the pastor. I will say one or two things on this from my experience. is to hold the hands of the pastor. If the pastor is running up and down the whole time, traditionally people say, my job, I'm a carpenter, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer. Uh, your job is pastor. So you have to do everything. But it's not possible. Ephesians 4, where we read earlier, verse 12 and 13, it says that we are coaches. Uh, it said he gave gives unto men, apostles, uh, for the edifying of the church, so that they can do the work of the ministry. The pastor is the coach. He's supposed, <laughs> you, apart from your job, which is good, you're an ambassador there, you also have responsibility as a believer in the church to grow. You cannot be in church for 10 years, 20 years, and you know, you're expected to be visited like a baby who just got saved yesterday. You also ought to grow and take people on. You know, maybe you're a deacon or not. So the pastors must delegate because a lot of pastors don't delegate, then they wear out and it affects their families. First Timothy 3 12, uh, you know, and 13 is also talking about deacons and how they can. Uh, it says, uh, in verse 13, it says, For they have used the office of a deacon well. They purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness of the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. There's something about you serving the Lord that heaven recognizes. It's not enough to just work your job nine to four, eight to five. In the church of God, be a help. A deacon is a help ministry. It's a help ministry. You, 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 need, to, you need to be a help. You need to find something you can do as you have been discipled in church to, to help the ministry of the pastor. Now, the apostles were the first gift visible in the early church, and then other gifts developed. Uh, but the thing here is that, you know, the apostles were the first pastors of the, of the early church. There was no other gift. It took time for gifts to, def to, to, to develop. The apostles of the Lamb, those who were with Jesus at the beginning, they were the ones that were more or less doing everything. There were certain people that Philip the evangelist, 
And because of that, elderly people were used to lead churches. And this is very, very important because it goes against the traditional concept that we know. And I want us to pay attention to this. Now, um, in First Timothy, oh, Titus rather, Titus 1.5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set other the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. That word elders, uh, really preposterous, really means, just means an elderly person, a senior. It's not a ministry gift. It's not a ministry gift. It's just an older person because gifts were still being developed. It was still increasing. I mean, God was still trusting people and raising them because the apostles were the ones who first pastored those churches and looked after them with the help of those deacons. Now, now, please let me be clear. Um, there are church systems that do that. Just find some elderly people to run things because there are not many ministry gifts there. And you know, elders in the local church, deacons in the local church, as far as I understand the Bible, they are also to hold the end of the pastor. Many times they become governmental authorities. Some churches are choked because, you know, I know of a church somewhere that some elders have been there for 50 years. They don't even know why they're elders. They just sit down and, you know, many of them you know, they were, they've been there since their 20s. Their father was an elder. Their, their mother was an elder. Their two they were elders. All that kind of traditional concept does not allow the church to be vibrant. So I believe that elders and deacons should hold the hand of the pastor. I will come to accountability of the pastor. Because someone will say, well, now there's a pastor, he's a dictator. I'm going to deal with that shortly. Um, a church leadership team should have other ministry gifts. A church leadership team. That means within your church, there should be teachers, there should be prophets, there should be other gifts within the leadership. And you don't need to go and say, okay, let me go and find a prophet to bring to my church. Let me go and find a prophet to bring to my church. Let me go and um, start with what you have. God will add to it. God will add to it. Because sometimes, oh, we must be New Testament, so let's find ministry gifts. So you start looking for people who don't even have your DNA. It's God that calls people to churches. So don't, don't, don't make the mistake, oh, I'm, I'm just a pastor here. Okay, I have an advantage. Let me find a prophet. Well, you better be careful. You and the team you have, if they will hold up your hand, anything with more than one head is a monster. The pastor is a primary authority in the local church. There have been areas of abuse here and I want to go to. The pastor is a primary authority in the local church. Um, <laughs> and it is important that we know that because the pastor is the, um, the primary authority in the local church, look at 1 Peter 5.1. Look at 1 Peter 5.1. The elders which are among you are exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Now, there are some of those elders in the church that God eventually made into pastors. The gifts eventually dropped into them. But when they started out, they just used elderly people. I mean, like we're in the mission fields. We have so hundreds of churches. Sometimes you go into a new area and you look around. There's nobody. So you find the oldest man in the congregation and say, hey, you're more mature naturally. Please lead these children. But eventually we find somebody with the gift of pastor and send them there. And we expect that elder or the deacon we put there to hold the hand of that pastor. I've seen churches all over the world suffer when elders and deacons don't understand their role. When elders and deacons want to tell the pastor what to preach, if he says God told him we should pray and fast and say they don't believe in it. If he says, well, let's have a prayer retreat, they don't believe in it. Or let's do youth work, we don't believe in it. Let's do this, we don't believe in it. Yeah. Now, you are not holding the hand of a pastor. You are a hindrance of a pastor. I know the next question somebody will ask me is that, um, well, does that mean the pastor has no accountability? Now, pastoral accountability means the pastor should be financially transparent, having audited accounts, 
allow for confirmation of direction he receives by the other pastoral oversight, as well as the health ministries of deacons and elders. Let me read it again. Pastoral accountability means the pastor should be financially transparent, having audited accounts, allowing for confirmation of direction he receives by the other pastoral oversight, as well as the other as the health ministries of deacons and elders. Now, what do I mean by this? That means that the pastor, if God says to the pastor, have uh, a children outreach, the other ministry gives in the church, maybe evangelist teachers, those who form your team, even if they are not evangelist teachers, maybe they are elders in the church, you need to share that and carry them along. But they must also understand their role. Their role is not sitting in judgment. Their role is not confrontation. It's not a political, the church is not a democracy. It's not a political party where the ye have it, the nay have it. I mean, if in your constitution, you have a place for voting, fine. But when it comes to spiritual direction of the church, allow that man to hear from God and hold up his hand. But in terms of finances and auditing of account, let the system take control. Let the system take control. And if God gives a pastor a leading, a wise pastor must have tact. T-A-C-T. You should have tact. You just don't go around and push everybody around and say, hey, God told me this. All of you shut up there. You must carry them along. It's very, very important. So the pastor is the leading authority of the local church. Deacons and elders should be delegated to handle the business side of the church. And let me also say that in order for a church not to have tunnel vision, that is where you just have a narrow vision, you can't see beyond, you know, you need to connect with um, other networks and have apostolic oversight. Now, let me be clear. It's very easy for a church, maybe it's a small church of 30, 50 people, just thinking about many ceremonies and burials and, you know, me, 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 they're not doing any mission, they're not going out beyond their own territory, they're not, they're not going to see their neighborhood, they're not socially relevant. Now, when you're in, with a network of churches, it can be helpful that you are also inspired. When you have apostolic oversight, an apostle cannot just come and say, I'm an apostle of our church, I'm taking your church. No, 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 no. If he hasn't started the church, uh, he doesn't have a right to do that. An apostle cannot just come to your church and say, I'm taking over this church. That, that's, a, that's an abuse of the apostolic office. Pastors should connect with networks. It's good because when it's just 30 people, sometimes you can become tunnel vision. You're only seeing two that many. You know, find other people that are networks that are bigger than yours that God leads you to. And the goal of the network is not to control the pastor, it's to inspire him. I have a network called Ministers Apostolic Network International. We have at the moment about 200 churches in that network. We don't run those churches. We, we go in, something happens, it might be death or they have crisis, we just go in to help them and see how we can, how we can help them and, and try to broaden their vision and let them see beyond the, the narrow scope. Uh, someone comes to your church and says, I'm an apostle, you must give me your offering. I'm an apostle, you must give me the pulpit. No, no, that, that, that's, 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 that's not the apostle. The apostle is called to serve you. It's called to serve you, not to rule you. It's called to serve you. But let me also say quickly that if you are, if you are in, a, in a church that has um, a system in place as a pastor, maybe, for example, you're in a church that has superintendents over you and they have district pastors over you, don't go there and try to change that. You don't go into a person's house and try to rearrange the furniture. You came there, you already have a system, See how you can work within that system. See how you can use some tact, humility, prayer to get those elders, to let them see, to broaden their vision. Otherwise, find yourself a place that suits you. But sometimes people go into a church and say, well, I'm the, I'm the ministry gifts. I'm supposed to be here. I'm the spiritual head of this church. And these elders are giving me trouble. Well, find somewhere that, where you can lead. But, but like I said, uh, there has to be a balance here. All right, I hope I've said enough there. Uh, I will not, I have one more, just one more thought. But if you read 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 7, I believe you will find 14 qualifications 
of pastors, bishops, and overseers. From 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, there are 14 qualifications. And I'll just, I'll just call them one by one. You can just, um, you, know, um, you know, it's the same for pastors. So you must be patient, not a brawler. A brawler is somebody who's always fighting, not covetous, and is not greedy for money. Your home must be well ordered. You should not be a novice. Don't be green. Get, get, get us some experience. You must not be given to wine. You are not somebody who's always in bars and drinking. You are vigilant. You are sober. You have good behavior. You are hospitable. Husband of one wife. No striker. Not giving. You're not always quarrelsome. You're not, you know, not giving. you not greedy for money and so on. There are qualifications there. I'm going to try to pick them up for you. And then in 1 Timothy 3, verse 8 to 13, you find the qualifications of deacons there. You can do well to look at them. Finally, the office of a teacher. I know we've been going for some time. It's longer than I thought. But the office of a teacher, uh, the, the 1 Corinthians 3, verses 6 to 9. I have planted Apollo's water, but God gave the increase. So neither he is he that planted anything, neither he that watered, but God gave it, but God had given the increase. Now he that planted and he that watered and watered, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, he are God's husbandry, and he are God's building. Teaching, the gift of teaching is not a natural gift, it's a supernatural gift. The teacher is represented by the little finger. So that's the only one that can get into your ear. Teaching under the anointing is never dry. A lot of people think that, well, teachers are dry, you know, they're not shouting at their bad ways, teachers are hard. But when teaching is done under the anointing, Paul said um, he had planted uh, and Apollos had watered. You know, teaching is watering. If, imagine a garden without water, it's going to dry. If you have your garden, even during the summer months when there's no, uh, you know, when it's a bit drier, you know, in the months that are dry, when there's no rain, you go to water the garden. And actually, some people have put the pastor and the teaching gift as one gift, pastor teacher, because there's that watering going. So people are not pastors, these are the gift to teach. They will be roving teachers and they will be based in the local church as well. A genuine teacher should never create confusion. And my rule of the thumb for a teacher is major on the major and minor on the minor. Major on the major and minor on the minor. Some teachers come in, they want to bring deep heavy revelation to a church. By the time they go, the poor pastor is thinking, how am I going to clean up all this mess? You know, some things you have to teach over a long period of time for people to understand. Amen. And the pastor comes and he teaches all these things and people, people are confused. Um, a genuine teacher um, should not create division. There are six fundamental principles of Christ in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. I'd like to read them. They are basic. Um, they can guide a teacher. They can guide all of us. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and fed towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. There are six of them. These principles are fundamental to our faith. We cannot negotiate on them. We must always teach them. Repentance from dead works. We are saved by grace. Amen? And we should leave the past behind. We should live a holy life. Faith towards God. Everything in the kingdom operates by faith. So a teacher, you can you can major on things like this. Tear people's faith up, you know? Um, uh, 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 repentance from dead works. Faith towards God. Our faith in the covenant. Our redemption in Christ. Things like that. How to, how to walk in faith in the reality of what Jesus did for us. The doctrine of baptisms. You know, you are baptized in the... Uh, the body, you, are, you are baptized in the body of Christ by God himself. Uh, you are baptized in water. You are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Those are fundamentals. Laying on of hands is also important. You know, we lay hands on the sick. We are said, we lay hands on the sick to recover. We lay hands also to release people to ministry for impartation. 
and things like that. Resurrection of the dead. Uh, it's important that, unfortunately, these days, uh, you know, you know, a lot of some of these things are not emphasized. But you know, when, you, when people remember that they are going to go to heaven, that uh, uh, if, if Jesus uh, if Jesus tarries, they are going to die one day, and their body will be raised supernaturally. You know, it, it helps you to live focused life. Resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. That okay, you know, uh, our works, you know, will be judged someday, and, and things like that. These are things that make our devotion to God very, very important. I also want to say that the New Testament church, we are more, we are more in the, we are more in the epistles of Paul. You realize that from the day. Um, uh, many of the things you, you read about, the revelations you read about are uh, in the epistles. Paul, was, Paul wrote so many things to us in the New Testament. I think we should focus major on the major. Sometimes uh, there are many things you learn in the seminary, many theological concepts that will not put on food on anybody's table. They are just for knowledge. They are just for you to be able to, you know, you, you need to be practical. Teaching should be practical. Uh, when teachings are too, when they are not simple, people are confused. They should be able to apply it. If, if, if it's not simple enough, I cannot apply. So um, I will have to say, I'm going to stop here and um, thank Pastor Apostle Grace for this opportunity. I'm sure there may be one or two questions. I don't know if you want to do that today or another time. You can decide. Uh, or maybe you can write the questions and then send it to me and we can have another session where I will deal with them. Uh, I think that probably will give you more time to gather your questions together. So I would rather suggest that because already we've been on for nearly two hours now. So maybe questions can be another day. I don't know what, what the set woman of this uh, commission thinks. Yeah, I'm so blessed. And I was, I, I, I close, uh, I, might, I mute my microphone to just listen. And I'm so blessed for the teachings. As uh, you have mentioned, I think uh, it's better that the questions can be sent. Uh, we can reserve it for next time when we get the time uh, to work on it because this is very profound teaching and uh, it's going to bless many, not only we here, but around the world. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us, to, to impact the knowledge to us. Uh, we appreciate you and we appreciate your ministry. Thank you so much, Apostle Grace, and greetings to all your precious people there in Norway. Uh, you have tried to get me to your ministry many times. I remember you uh, when you were in, uh, what's that place? In, um, uh, Minister. Uh, uh, Science Dell. And I did yeah. teach at your, Bible, at your Bible school many years ago and prayed for you. Uh, you are doing well. Uh, unfortunately, I've not been able to come to your ministry. But now with, with all these uh, things in the world now, you're able to have me on your platform. What an honor. I thank you so very much. And the Lord bless you. Um, I'll be happy to take questions. And when you send them to me, I will fix the time. And I, I say a big blessing to all your people there. Lord, I just pray your, your, your grace on everybody who has joined us today. And I just ask, oh God, that you will increase them on the inside. You will strengthen them with might by your spirit in the inner man. Perfect all that concerns them. I thank you that we will live purposefully in this end time. And your grace will be strong upon us. We will find our place and fulfill our ministries. To you be all the glory, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.